Hi guys, it's Jordan from Foundry, and welcome to Learning Katana Part 1 of 3. Yeah, so we're going to spend the next three weeks, about an hour each week, going through Katana. So today will be basics, just getting you familiar with the program. So if you've only ever seen a screenshot, maybe you've seen that at a, a trade show, maybe a video on the web, or talked to a friend about it, uh, this is the one that will get you up and running. So installing the software, getting a render plugin going, and actually being able to navigate your way around and, and feel at home. Uh, part two, we will look at the look development process. So what does it take to actually make and create shaders, assign them? How would you take an asset and actually achieve the desired art direction with it? So this is separate from the things you would need to do in terms of uh, Renderman, Arnold, V-Ray, 3D Light, Redshift, all that. Um, those techniques are still particular to those programs, but we're going to cover the part that is specifically about uh, the Katana workflow. And then part three, we're going to learn how you take that work and you bring it into Katana uh, as part of a shot production or a shot or a sequence of shots. One of the cool things with Katana is the fact that you can manage a whole sequence. And we've got a little short animation that we can share with you. And we will look at how would you actually go about doing that and what the benefits are and how do you just manage your way through all of that. And the outcome of all three weeks should be that you are settled and ready to go. You have an idea of how you could use bare bones Katana to get going so that when you do start experimenting and if you want to start deploying this into a pipeline, you have all the fundamentals covered and you have a good idea of the things you want to start looking at in terms of uh, making it fit into your pipeline automation and so on. Okay, so without further ado, uh, let's move on to the next part. All right, so a bit of housekeeping uh, before we dig in too far into the nitty gritty. Wanted to point out on the new Foundry uh, website how we have a very nice form area and uh, the focus uh, ongoing is to give you guys a really good place to come and find things about Katana. And so with that, we have the Katana learning materials area. Uh, this is the, the, um, the post that will be our discussion point for this lesson and things about it. I'll upload files from uh, this session into here so you guys can have a look at it and then that'll help out. Uh, we also have a broader area and just want to give you guys a little rundown. Please come and have discussions with us here about uh, look development and lighting in general. It's not just about uh, Katana. I think there's a lot to be said about the crossover of many artistic and technical disciplines as it relates to cinematography, rendering, computer graphics, everything that kind of goes into what an artist spends their time and why they spend their time uh, doing things with Katana and tools like it. So please feel free to come here and engage us with that. Uh, learning materials is just the one that we were at. Workflows, if you want to ask questions about how to do things, this is the place to come and sort of say, okay, how would I actually uh, you know, connect together this network shader inside of Katana versus how I do it in Maya? This is the place to come ask it. Scripting, if you want to know things about Python and Lua, uh, this is definitely the place to come and find those questions. And this is also where all the older technical uh, materials have been migrated to. The Katana APIs, uh, think of this as if you are going more hardcore into the C-level uh, type work, then that's where you want to be, okay? And finally, uh, what's going to happen with this webinar is that it will come to our new Fancy Dancy Learn section on the website. So right now it's pretty sparse for Katana, but this video itself will be posted there. The uh, subsequent uh, uh, videos from the other weeks will be there. And then we're going to start putting in uh, videos in for about more detail about every section. If I went through everything in the detail I really want to, uh, we would be together for about three hours. And I want to keep this uh, moving at a good pace for you so that uh, you know, your eyes don't roll into the back of your heads and get complete information overload. I want to give you a good overview. That's the purpose of today. But please, come check out these areas. We will be posting in the learning section when things have uh, been added to this. So keep an eye out. Subscribe to the forums. Uh, you can, any of these points, you can use uh, the, where are we? Uh, 
this uh, button on the left here will allow you to find out when you get notifications. So please use that, sign up, be an active part of the community. And uh, yeah, without further ado, let's move on to the next part. We didn't go very far. We left. We, we just left the forums, now we're back at them. What I want to point out to you guys is that uh, getting things started on Katana is not an actual gnarly process. So in this link or this forum post, I've written up an article on how to actually get Katana. Uh, pardon the old website screenshots, we'll get those updated. But essentially, everything that is relevant to what you want to do is still here. So the whole process of installing Katana on Windows, very straightforward. Uh, Linux, if you have questions about that, let us know. It's based on a, a simple script, so it, uh, it's fairly straightforward. Okay, but the important thing for you guys to understand before we get going, because I'm sure that some of you will want to follow along with us later on, is that Katana, when it, uh, you get it installed, if you had a desktop icon and you double clicked on it, it's gonna load, but it's gonna load without any rendering plugins. So the way that we configure Katana is by the use of startup scripts. So either a bash shell script or a batch uh, script on, on Windows. And so what I've done here is I've posted uh, a very simple example of one that actually has most of the render plugins covered. And so you should just be able to uh, copy this whole thing and then just uh, basically cut out the parts you don't need. So if you don't have Arnold installed, you've got RenderMan, you leave the RenderMan parts. If you have 3 light and not Arnold, then so on and so forth. So the thing to uh, take note is that there are instructions on how to use it, uh, which parts you do need to change. This Katana specific section here, you do uh, want that. Uh, note that I've got some of my own personal laptop uh, things in here as examples. So some of the stuff you don't need. So this one, uh, if you don't have uh, custom shelves or tools, then you don't need to have these in there. But this is at least how you find it. Uh, also note that what I've done is I've looped uh, essentially the declaration of the environment variable so that if you want to add things in, you don't constantly have to make a very long, 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 long string. Uh, you can basically concatenate uh, the environment variable by taking it and adding to it. And that's the way that this all works with these Katana resources mainly. Okay, so there you go. That is how you would get started. And we will... Um, update this as things change between the render vendors and us and so on and so forth but this will give you should give you the starting point that you need all right so here we are we are inside Katana this is 2.5 v5 this is the default arrangement that most of you will find when you uh, start Katana for the first time I wanted to start here so that you at least had a reference point uh, from here, I'm going to show you how uh, you can customize the UI, and then we're going to switch to the layout that I prefer working on. Now, Katana uh, uses a lot of tabs uh, for different aspects of the program, so depending on what you're doing, you can make the configuration that works best for you uh, for the task you have at the time. Like Nuke, you can make layouts, you can save them, and, and uh, they all go to your .katana folder, so you're, you're all squared away there. Now, uh, what you need to understand is that when you start working with Katana, you need to understand the basic relationships between the actions that are performed in the various tabs that informs the layout you might want uh, to have. So uh, let's look at actually how you can customize. First off, in any pane, all the available tabs, both custom and default, are available here. Okay, so here's the list of all the tabs. Uh, we'll cover these in different videos over different periods of time. So we're gonna work with the primary ones uh, for this video. But they're all here, you can explore them, go find them in the manual. All right, so you start off by, if you want to start configuring, is as you drag around, you can see you get this orange line around the pane as I start moving things around. So splitting panes is really easy. You just grab a tab and you start moving it. So if you want to split things top to bottom, left, right, 
here and I'll square it away. If you simply just want to move between various tabs or paint tabs between panes, it's a simple drag operation, no sweat. If you want to make a new pane, it's easy enough to then go to an area like this far left one here and it will open up a new pane. So you can see you can really start to customize this. I can come in and then say, well, actually I want this. So I drag lower, it will appear there. And let's say that I wanted, actually, well, you know what, Python, I like going wide, long curved line. So let's add that to the bottom. And I can take the viewer and I can move over here and I can split this. And the parameters, well, I like it more like nuke. All right, so I'm gonna move that across to here. So you can see that you can completely uh, get into pain Tetris, uh, if you wanna call it that. Uh, but you can customize it. You can get it all figured out uh, to what works for you. And then uh, you simply come down and say you wanna save the current layout. And, and then you can give it a name and away you go. Okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to shift my layout over to the one that I like. Uh, it's based on the idea that I have most spend most of my time on a laptop. So I try and make the most of the screen real estate. And um, I encourage you guys to figure out what works for you and work with it that way. There aren't any uh, particular things in learning Katana that you are going to be crippled by a layout unless you are not uh, making regular use of a tab that is part of the default workflows between uh, various aspects of the program. So experiment, have fun, figure out what works for you, and um, yeah, you, you can get yourself all started that way. All right, so here we are in my, what I call my laptop nuke, and I call it nuke, or laptop nuke, because I like having the parameter uh, list on the right hand side here to be uh, the full length. It does come in handy. All right, but let's get looking into what actually uh, we have and why we have it. Uh, we'll go full screen, get ourselves a little bit more room. All right, so going from top left to, to top right, we have the monitor, which all important, this is where you actually uh, see your images. So being a lighting and rendering tool, you've got to figure you're going to make an image. So this one's pretty important to have up. You also have access to things like Adobe Sheet, Curve Editor. We'll cover those in a different video. So monitor plus these other two. Now the next part we have over here to the right is the viewer. So this is pretty much, you know, what's as it's marked on the tin. It's the 3D viewer for the scene. And then next to it, we have a catalog. Now, the catalog is the index of all the things that have been rendered. You can see I was fixing some sub Ds here. That's why you see the banding on the background going away. So you have multiple slots. Each render that you do gets captured into a slot. Uh, you can do foreground, background. We'll cover everything in detail uh, another time. But just know that the catalog and the monitor are kind of joined at the hip. These two go together. Whenever you make uh, one in here, you are, or a renderer in here, you are going to have it cataloged here, uh, appropriately named. So the next thing over is the parameters. So the parameters can't really sort of be talked about without saying what do they control or what do they have impact over. The parameters are, just like Nuke, the controls you have over the nodes. Okay, so if I look at this one here, we can see that I have a node that is an Arnold object settings that is set up to make sure that uh, the geometries are going to render as sub D. Pretty straightforward. Okay, nodes, there's an undo history. So for those of you that are curious about it, it's all pretty straightforward. You can look and see what you've done. Okay, so moving down, uh, we have the scene graph. So bottom left here, scene graph. This one is another one of the key players in Katana that you really need to kind of come to terms with. The scene graph is uh, 
for those of you from Maya, pretty much the exact equivalent of the outliner. It is your hierarchical tree view of your scene. It has more to it, uh, but in essence, when you are looking at a 3D scene and you want to find something in that organization, this is where it's going to find you're going to find it. Uh, the scene graph, we refer to all the items in it as scene graph locations. So when you hear somebody or you read part of the manual saying, okay, for your scene graph location, that's what they're talking about. They're talking about all these various pieces that refer to your uh, the item in the scene, which can be described as a path because of the hierarchy. So we start at root, root, we've got world, we've got geo, and then we've got a bunch of things underneath geo. Depending on where your models have come from, these are all made within Katana. So uh, there isn't sort of the shape node and then the group node and so on and so forth. Uh, but you, you get the idea. Uh, we'll cover this later on, but uh, briefly, there's something called the working sets, which allow you for, in this case, control what's visible in the viewer. So we can see a few of these items popping back in. Let's go up to the top, pull in the sweep. So you have control over what is visible in the viewer from an artist's perspective. So you've got a big viewer that you're worried about or a big scene, uh, start cutting back to just what you want to see. Same idea here, this column allows you to control what is in a render. So if I turn this one on and it had matching locations, only those small teapots in the, in the sweep would actually be in the renders. And then finally, you have here the column that controls which updates or which scene graph locations can have their updates sent to a live render. Why is this important? If you have a very large scene and you wanted to use live rendering, you don't want to necessarily have to flood the communication channels between Katana and the renderer to say, here's a whole set of updates when really you just want to be sparse, you want to be very refined and say, you know what, this is the one thing I'm changing out of the 10,000 in my scene. Uh, you guys don't have to have scenes that big, but it's just the tool is built to be capable of handling scenes that big. Okay, so the scene graph, which segues nicely into the node graph, which is kind of like the piece de resistance. How does this all come together? So let's look at it this way. I've got a node here that creates a teapot. Now what I've done is I've set both flags on it. So every node in Katana typically has a view flag and an edit flag. The view means, hey Katana, show me the 3D scene as it exists at that node, right? So what that means is that this node is meant to make a teapot, so that's all that's in the 3D scene. So what we then have is a view of the 3D scene from a text-based hierarchical list. We have the 3D view of it. And then sneakily, we also have the full attributes of any one particular object inside that scene or one scene graph location. So it's not just the objects, it could be any of these locations, right? So this, the distinction for you guys to remember is that these attributes that are here are read-only, but they can be queried by the parameters, right? So you can set up a control on a node to do something based on the state of attributes on a scene graph location. We'll talk more about that in a minute. All right, so basics. You view something, you see it in the 3D viewport, you see it in the scene graph, and you have access to make uh, or inspect the attributes of a item at a time that is within the 3D scene created at that node, right? And then we'll cover this in a minute, but you go on and you start combining these together. But I wanna finish the UI tour first. All right, Python tab. Everybody loves Python. Uh, one thing I wanted to point out is the preferences have a very useful mode. So. If you see this uh, auto completion behavior is IDE, that is the one that you want. 
it will probably come in defaulted to shell. My recommendation, change it to IDE, and here's why. As soon as you start typing, you get presented all the various Python modules within uh, Katana, and then you can simply uh, choose one. So let's say NodeGraph API, it's a big one to use. And then as soon as you put a dot, you get presented next layer down and so on and so forth. So this is a, a really powerful uh, way to start learning. Katana is structured differently than new, uh, Maya. So in terms of what you expect from that tool with the ability to echo all commands and kind of learn your way through the Python, that doesn't quite exist in Katana. Uh, so learning the Python side, you will have to spend more time experimenting with the IDE and then also uh, working with our developer documentation, which is right here. You can access it and it will just pop up nicely searchable, fully accessible, and well used. And this will obviously be always improving throughout the various releases. Okay, so that's the Python tab. Vendor log, uh, another one that's kind of paired nicely with the monitor. So every render that you do creates a, a render log which is then separated by, it's matched to the render that it came from. Attributes tab we already talked about. So the attributes are the read only set of metadata about a scene graph location. And then another handy one is the UV viewer. So here we got our teapot UVs. All right, so that is the overview of what I feel are the basic uh, tabs that you need to have in a layout in order to have basically a successful uh, learning experience within Katana. You might find that, you know what, um, I really don't care about the render log uh, for what I'm doing most of the time, so you're going to sort of close it off, and that's easy enough. You just close tabs, and you can detach them and, and whatnot, and uh, you can decide whether or not you want to show the timeline. So you may not need the timeline, turn it off. If you don't need the UV viewer, uh, because you're doing shop-based production and you're only going to bring it up if you actually have an issue, turn it off. You can start pairing back to what you need for your workflow and then you can arrange things in screen space uh, to maximize what you want out of those tools and how important they are to your particular workflow. But that will be up to you. Okay, so here we are. We're in that same file looking at the node graph. We've gone through the UI. Uh, we have a sense of what all the tabs are. So let's start talking about how Katana uh, operates, how maybe you should think about it uh, to get your head wrapped around it, and then start talking about the relationships between the various tabs so we can start building our way up to uh, how you would actually construct a scene like this. Okay, so we covered the idea that pretty much every single node in Katana, you have a view and an edit flag. Now, as we said, the scene graph is generated by the node that has this one. So don't uh, forget about that because it can come and trip you up later on and I'll explain why in a minute. So getting your head wrapped around why the node graph, what are you doing with it? Um, there are different ways to think of compositing, or sorry, Katana. Uh, one that seems to work for a lot of people is that it's 3D scene compositing. All right, so if you're from Nuke, or you spend a lot of time with Nuke, if you've never worked in a node-based 3D program, think of it this way. The same way that you uh, take a series of images and you bring them into Nuke, you layer them or combine them, you merge them together, you then uh, isolate changes to certain ones, uh, even portions of a certain one. You also then uh, make color corrections and so on. You then uh, reach a point where you are done and you want to render that out. You are fundamentally doing a similar process inside of Katana. So let's take a look at what we have here. So I've got a node that makes a teapot, a node that makes a pony. I am merging them together so the scene at this node is now a teapot and a pony. 
Okay, so straightforward as it's marked on the tin. Now, what we want to do is we start saying, okay, well, I want to make the objects into subdivision surfaces. I want to uh, make copies of the pony and the teapot. I have a series of notes. Now, when you see this one here, this item or this icon, uh, that node decorator means that this is a stack. And what a stack looks like is this. So essentially, it is a collection of like nodes that are grouped together in a node for, uh, well, for keeping your, your scene or your node graph clean, actually. So here I have one, two, three, four transform 3D nodes. If I had those floating in the scene, it's very likely you start getting things more and more cluttered. And as you want to use Katana, uh, no, Katana node graph as a template, it is important to understand that uh, how you show information and how you organize your node graph is as important as what you do with it. You rarely use Katana alone. So adopt the philosophy that if you want to work in a team of people, uh, keeping a nice, tidy node graph really goes over well. Uh, it helps in the flow. It helps in diagnosing uh, where things are. Okay, so same idea. We then have a stack of transforms that moves the ponies. And then what we have from this side is I have a, a Lemic model of that background sweep. I bring it in, I scale it, and I assign uh, the sub D attributes to it from Arnold. On this side, we have more teapots on the go. And then we merge all that together. And we actually have made a camera and bring that together. So you can see, literally, this is just like a new uh, compositing node graph. I am, instead of uh, images, I have 3D objects, I'm mashing them together, and I'm starting to make changes to them, like the uh, applying of the sub D attribute, or I'm copying them if they were just like little sprites and scattering them around. So all that comes together. Now we'll talk about uh, collections in a minute, um, but essentially they're like Maya selection sets, but we'll, we'll save that for when we talk about cell. All right, then I come down to this point and I've made uh, three materials. As you can see in the render, we end up with three colors, so that lines nicely. Uh, then we assign those materials. So everything is a nice visible track record of the work that you've done. So not every button click, not every mouse movement is recorded as a node. So some of these encapsulate a lot of that. So don't, don't fear the idea that everything you do, uh, I can't twitch the mouse without making a node. Not true, you're fine. Uh, we have the gaffer three, which we'll talk about in detail. This is your lighting control panel. Uh, depending on the render you're using, uh, you will be presented with different options for lights. But fundamentally, everything about lighting uh, happens here. You don't have to use the Gafford 3, but for a production scene, there are a lot of reasons why you do want to use that, and that'll be in the third uh, week that we cover that. Okay, so then we get down to a nice little segue that we'll take in a second. Uh, we've got the idea of the render globals. So in Maya, you have the render globals tab, it, or pane. It has uh, multiple tabs, depending on the render that you're using but it follows the same uh, philosophy uh, as we have here. So instead of having a pane with multiple tabs, we have two nodes that work in conjunction with each other, which is we have our render settings node. So if I hit this, you'll see it's right here. Okay. And this is where we can decide what camera from the 3D scene that is existing at this point are we going to use uh, for the rendering, we tell which render we're going to use, we set the resolution, and so on and so forth, and all the various aspects. Then you get down to the render vendor specific thing, so in this case with Arnold, we have the Arnold Globals. So depending on the render plugin you use, you will have different sets of nodes. 
uh, but they will all have some commonality and we'll talk about that next. And then finally, we've got the menu node. So one thing you should note is that a lot of these actions are taking place in a nice vertical spine. So we're not, uh, we have no requirement to bring things together, break them apart, put them back together, break them apart, put them back together. You can work very cleanly in a nice vertical line, uh, which keeps things quite uh, neat and tidy. And we'll explain why you can do that uh, in a minute when we talk about cell. So one last uh, bit of housekeeping before we move on. Uh, other things to keep in mind. You can group your nodes together. Okay. Cool thing with Katana, even if they're grouped, uh, you don't have to dive directly into the group to edit them. You can uh, basically hit the plus, which will pop up a window, and you then have access to all those nodes. So depending on what you do, uh, where you fit in the pipeline and your responsibility, you can make a very clean, nice layout. So you can see here, maybe that's all that an artist actually needs. Um, but that's to be decided later. The next cool thing I wanted to just touch on briefly is this idea of live groups. So we have here convert to live group. If I select that, this gets this nice fancy new icon. Uh, but more than that, I can say that I want to uh, publish and finish editing contents. So what this means is that I can actually write that series of nodes that I group together to a file on disk. And the significance of that is uh, that it can be shared. It sort of, as the name says, it's, it's live. So you can use versioning to uh, make sure that you're not ac absolutely sort of automatically running over each other's files. But you can actually access uh, nodes that have been shared to a network location and bring them into your file. And just think of it, it's pretty much like Maya's file referencing. Uh, the difference is because these are just operations taking place on scene graph locations or adding new scene graph locations, you can fundamentally uh, get into like an inception mode where you have a live group uh, that contains a set of nodes. You could have another live group that contains more live groups that all have th their each individual nodes and so on and so forth. So you can kind of bundle these things up. Um, I wouldn't recommend going too deeply into that until you've got your head wrapped around it and you've decided that that's the right choice for your pipeline. But once you're there, you shouldn't feel like there are strong uh, limitations on uh, using more than one level of live group in your scene. Okay, finally, beyond that, uh, when you actually are adding nodes, it's like Nuke, you hit tab, you get presented this list, you can start typing in that you want to have Arnold, and or you might want to have the Armand. Oh, not loaded on this file. Uh, we could have the three delight. I'll explain the PR man uh, thing in a minute. And you could say that you wanted to have an Olympic in, so you can keep finding your way through it. If you want to explore all the nodes uh, that are available, I strongly suggest you come to this list here and look at uh, the new menu because it shows you how things are actually split out. And unless you go through the documentation, you would be shocked to find out how many types of constraints you have available to you and just the various options of all the different node types that are available that fit the different uh, roles within Katana. So definitely as you explore through tap menu, uh, you can also use wildcards. So you can say star, something rather star. Uh, if you have a lot of nodes you're trying to find, uh, you can use this new menu and go ahead and just explore around and you'll see. So what is the relationship between the plugins for Katana and Katana itself? Uh, or rather, the nodes and who's responsible for what? So Katana is responsible for importing, collecting, and basically massaging uh, the objects inside of your, your 3D scene, applying the lighting, applying materials, uh, the relationship with the rendering plugins is that they obviously provide the engine, they provide the actual shaders, and they uh, provide the ability to do vendor-specific 
workflows, uh, even if it's something as common as XGen or Yeti and things like that. So one way to start exploring is that if you just hit tab, and this is also a way to confirm that the plugin is loaded, is that you just start typing in, uh, after you hit tab, the first letters that you want to look at. So in this case, this is all the nodes that are part of the Arnold plugin. So we've got global settings, which is going to be consistent uh, one way or the other across all the rendering plugins. So this is where their render globals uh, get set. You have object settings. So in this case, with the Arnold ones. And the object settings are the vendor specific flags that you would normally set and say on something like Maya and like et extra attributes. Uh, so they are things that are not native to the 3D application that is hosting the plugin that the render needs to achieve certain results or make certain changes. So ray visibility, things like that, which are particular to each render vendor are going to be on this object settings nodes. Now, the Arnold guys uh, have done a great job. We've got the, the uh, BDB nodes that are built in by default. So in general, every renderer out there that has got a Katana plugin has some level of support for pretty much everything, be it Yeti with render procedurals for that tool, uh, VDB and whatnot. The difference between the rendering plugins is only going to be in those cases, do they support it directly? Or do you need to chain together a render procedural node and you know primitive node and so on and so forth to kind of manually construct a tool to load that information to use it with that renderer? So Arnold's got VDB already built in. The output channel defined is something that you're going to find common across all the, uh, the rendering plugins. So this is where you are defining a shader AOV light path expression channel that you want to come from the renderer so that it can be written to disk. The shading node, again, is consistent across all the renderers. So uh, we package up or have the render vendor package up into a single node all their shading nodes. So what you would see expressed in Maya as a full set of nodes uh, is all packaged up into one. And I can show you how you can sort of work with that inside of Katana quite easily. Uh, user data is specific to Arnold. The XGen, uh, Arnold and a couple of the others are uh, directly supporting XGen and Arnold has got the direct Yeti support. So let's take a look at some of the other ones. Okay, so we've got three to light. So camera settings, global settings, again, consistent uh, with one uh, adjustment that I'll tell you in about a minute. Uh, object settings, output channel defined, DL settings, shading node, XGen, right? So uh, as each render render sort of adds functionality, then they can just add a new node that takes care of it. Now, quick word about these guys, the DL settings, uh, is actually what we call a super tool and it combines the output channel define, the global settings and um, and our render settings and everything else into one particular node so that you have uh, a overall UI which they've modeled after their Maya plugin. So very clean, easy to add in a a new pass, so on and so forth. So these are all things that everybody can do. You can build that up yourself if you wanted to. These guys have just done it uh, as well. Let's take a look at PR Man. If I start with actually P, that would help. All right, here we are. So we've got uh, nodes for their denoise workflow. We've got the global statements again. So. Uh, don't be confused by statements. The globals, this is their uh, global settings node. Uh, and then they have extra tools for their specific workflows. Again, object statements can uh, very consistent. Uh, object visibility, output channel defined, shading node. So you can see that there's a common theme and everybody is able to kind of add more around it, but there's definitely a consistent theme in terms of the dividing line between what you're going to set in Katana versus what you're going to uh, set in another package. And then very quickly, let's look at our friends over at V-Ray. They've, the Chaos Group have added, um, you know, they have their fur node, but they have again, global settings, object settings, output channel defined, shading node. So it's all there. 
and then you have uh, the other workflows that they've added in. Okay, and very quickly, the guys have been working very hard on this one, uh, Redshift. So uh, they have live render settings, object settings. The render settings here are their global uh, settings, so that's fine. And then the shading notes. So everybody's, like I said, it's all consistent. It's all kind of across the board. It's all good to go. And uh, at any time, you guys just figure you would put together uh, in terms of like a render globals, you would put in, let's say, that combination there. I've added the camera create so that it doesn't error out, but it's really just this combination of nodes you just have to get used to. And that way you're all all set. Okay. All right, let's go back to the other file and have a poke around it. Okay, back in this file. And uh, I wanted to start talking with you about how do you actually interact with things inside of Katana? Uh, most things, you're moving around, middle mouse button, fairly straightforward, scroll wheel, whatnot, all works nicely. Part of the really powerful workflow in Katana, when you think about this whole idea of the node graph, you don't want to create this from scratch every time. It's to create templates, okay? Uh, but Templates are only as good as their ability to be flexible and reusable. So uh, that's when something called cell comes into play. So uh, let's take a look at this one. So, and by the way, cell stands for collection expression language. Um, short awesomeness. All right. So we've got a teapot node, a pony node. We bring them together. Then we get down to here. We want to make sure these two things come out of sub D when it's rendered through Arnold in this case. Now, how do you do that? Why did I say that you fundamentally can generally work in long spines rather than branches and merging them together uh, all the time? And the answer is cell, so that you can be laser focused on exactly what objects in the scene each node takes place. So typically, any node you have, it's going to perform an action. So you have the node, its actions that's gonna take, the parameters that control what it's going to do, and then you will have a cell field that tells it or which specific items in the scene uh, to act on if it's actually not creating something new for the scene. So, how do you go about that? Well, first off, let's cover uh, what we have here. So the most powerful uh, idea of cell is the idea of the expression. Uh, so here, what I have is this uh, node that's going to make, uh, I set the, the sub D attributes on the John tree for Arnold. And I'm using the custom field. And I'm saying that I want the root, the world, the geo, and then I hit star. So wildcard, we've all used them everywhere in our life. So it's taking everything underneath Geo. So in this case, it's actually not too expensive because it only has two nodes to search. And then it's going to match against those. But you get into interesting options when uh, you have the idea of being able to actually then query attributes. So like I said before, your parameters can reference the attributes that are part of any scene graph location, right? So this is a perfect example of it. We have a, the sub D node or make sub D Arnold object settings node that I'm using to set the sub Ds. And what I'm able to do is say, take everything in the scene, but then I'm have this expression that says then, uh, referring to the attributes of you know, looking for the type attribute, if it is equal to poly mesh, then it matches and everything returns true, then it's like, okay, I'm gonna, that's one I act on. Uh, and the same thing here, you can then get into combining multiple um, of these, and you also have difference in intersect modes. 
And in this case, because the pony model comes in already as a sub D, uh, it would not have the attribute set to it. So I'm uh, doing the same thing here. I could have just said geo star and not left it, but then it would be, you know, so it wouldn't be so much fun to try and explain it without it. Okay. So that's the expression side of things. Word of warning. It's the old Spider-Man saying, with great power comes great responsibility. You say that you want to do something at root world geo star, and you've got a scene that has, you know, a lot more geometry, you know, tens, thousands, whatever you want to, you know, like whatever is big for your scene uh, below that point, and you, you are going to match against all those scene graph location names first, and then even if you're using the attribute to query it out. So it's not like you can shortcut what it matches against just on the attribute first. So remember, you match by the scene graph location name, then the attribute. So uh, use your wildcards responsibly and also use that as a way to debug if things are going slow. If all of a sudden it's like, all right, I, you know, when to actually start using it uh, and things like it is bogging down, then asking yourself, uh, search through your nodes, find one that has got the most uh, egregious, highest sort of broad search uh, using wildcards and go from there and start trying to be a little bit more refined. But uh, this you know, also uh, comes with some pretty cool options to it when you think about it. Because these attributes can also be on the Alembic meshes that you reference in through an Alembic in or other method into Katana. So if you start tagging your uh, meshes on export, you can start actually doing really cool things. So you could have your house that has a roof. You could be setting an attribute roof color on the Alembic uh, geometry as you export it. You could have roof color equals blue. And then you could actually have a material assignment node that says, okay, uh, because you have matched against, uh, you have the roof color equals blue, my operation is that I am supposed to assign the blue roof shader, so I'm going to assign it to you. Uh, and then it ignores everything else and so on and so forth. So the implications are you can achieve a great deal of uh, automation that a Katana artist doesn't necessarily need to touch uh, by making use of these hooks in your pipeline. And again, you don't need to have a big team to do this. It's just you have to be aware of the potential for how you can use things as they come from one package into the next. All right, so that's one way to do it. Uh, the most basic is simply here, uh, this idea of paths. So this is typically what you'll see as the default uh, method. I am middle mouse dragging from the scene graph into here. I can uh, shift middle mouse drag from the viewer. If I had everything. Helps when you don't actually press the cap lock scheme instead of the shift. Okay, so teapot, let's bring in our nice friendly pony here. So we've got those two in. And then finally, uh, another way to go about this, which is really cool, is that every render in Katana makes use of uh, sending back a geo, a geo ID or geometry ID. So select your picker, control click on the pixel, you get the list here. Now here's where things get interesting, and I wanted to explain this earlier. I've created an image from a point farther down in my node graph. But as far as the scene graph and the viewer are concerned, I'm working with the, this node. So when I come up to this geo picker and I basically say, hey, select this one in the scene graph, it's going to go nowhere and you're going to be sitting there banging your head against uh, your desk going, why isn't it working? Why isn't it working? Well, the answer is um, just make sure that you are far enough down in your, in your actual node graph that the image that you've made aligns with what's in the actual geometry buffer so that when you say select in the scene graph that you actually get that point and you can find it in your scene graph. Anyways, that's an aside. So here we go. We can actually, um, and the I guess the other corresponding point to watch out for is that you don't want to be editing a node upstream 
and asking it to then act on a node uh, or a scene graph location that doesn't exist till later, right? So I've said that I want on this node, which is just those two things, to take this teapot and add it in. So that's an actual invalid selection. Okay. And then finally, we actually have the idea of collections. Now, collections are, like I said before, like my selection sets. So you essentially can group a set of scene graph locations underneath a shorthand name and then take actions on uh, inside of nodes referring to that name, which is that collection of things, uh, rather than uh, having to do things by hand or select them. So between the expressions and the collections, you can create very uh, flexible templates in the node graph. So that means that they have a high degree of reusability between scenes, between shots, however you're, you're using your templates. And that is a key cornerstone to being successful and happy with Katana. So um, keep that in mind. So let's take a look at what we have here. So collections, uh, again, remember we are editing a node upstream of where we actually are. So let's just look at this one. And here we have an expression. So what's, oh, this is the part that, that I always love. So you've got, uh, again, more cell statements. So paths, collections, custom. Um, not sure I'd recommend getting to inception level collections made by collections, but uh, you know, let's stick with the first two. So the most powerful aspect of this, the fact that you can actually say that you want to populate a collection by using an expression, right? So I can now say that it's going to have root world geo pony star. So all my ponies that are at the party are going to get put into this collection called ponies. And I've got one for the teapots, right? Okay. Now let's see where this actually comes into play. Is that on here, instead of actually uh, assigning, uh, pardon me, looking at the material now, let's go a little bit farther. If we get to the assigning of the materials, what we can do is just reference the teapot collection. But because up higher I've made a collection that is running made by an expression, I could make 20, 30, 50, 100, 10,000 new teapots, it doesn't matter. As long as they get matched by that cell expression, they will be fed into this teapots collection and therefore they are going to get this green material. So really, you know, ultra powerful uh, in that you can design your node graph with a template that, you know, if you, let's say you're doing episodic production, uh, you always know that you're going to have characters split into one layer, background split into the other. You can use collections to do that splitting of those objects so that they get assigned to the right uh, selection set that you can, or uh, collection, so that you can use them uh, later on. And again, assigning shaders, if you were using uh, look files, again, all these things we can will expand on, but it's just that one degree of the cell uh, and its flexibility through its use of collections, the expressions, and the explicit lists uh, is pretty awesome. Okay, so here we've got uh, the sweep being assigned, and then we have the ponies, which will be assigned by their shading group. Now, one thing I wanted to sort of emphasize that I think is pretty cool is that you can assign uh, materials at any point in this hierarchy once you're talking about the geometries. So we could assign a gray shader to everything, right? In fact, let's do this right now. Uh, let's swap this around. So I'm just going to use Shift X to uh, pull the gray material out. And what I'm going to do is I'm just going to stick it here in the middle, right? So let's get this in here. There we go. 
So you hover over the pipe connection, and once your your cursor crosses it, you'll see the the in and the out highlight, and you know that you're going to insert it. So what am I going to do here? Uh, I had explicitly said that I wanted a sweep. Now instead of doing the sweep, because this is actually happening first, let's just pick geometry. So this is an important thing to understand about katana is that until you uh, essentially bake something by resolving it uh, or um, by uh, the act of rendering, which also does that uh, resolve step, everything is malleable. All these attributes you can override, you can change everything. So it's this nice cookie dough state, if you will. Uh, you can you know, pick out the chocolate chips and put in almonds if, if that's your thing. Right, so we've done this. We should now essentially get the exact same render, which we do. But what we've done now is that fundamentally the shader has been assigned to every single piece of geometry. And then the next step down, once we get into the assigning of uh, the green and the red materials, it then overrides at a lower level. So let's look at that from the attribute standpoint. So we come to geometry here, and uh, let's just make sure we're on the right node. So you can see a nice little hint for you guys is that these little arrows, if you're not looking at one of the green, if it's not the green or the blue flag are not on a node in your currently available node graph, you can see where they are uh, by the little arrow, appearance of those arrows. So I'm just going to make sure we're set up down here. Viewing from here. All right, so geometry. We're looking at root world geo. We're looking far enough down to see the collection of the attributes. So you can see that it has the gray material assigned to it, right? So that gets inherited down uh, by the nodes below it. So you can see the material sign, and you can see that it uh, has that uh, color because it's coming from somewhere else. Here you can see it's yellow, but at this level you know it's an inherited attribute uh, because of that. Now we get down to, let's say, we take a look at pony, and the pony has its own discrete assignment. So it's not sort of that light gray blue. Uh, it's not inherited from somewhere else. It's come from uh, the uh, the overrides that have come, happened based on the fact that we've assigned these things here. So again, render time, everything gets sorted out, fed to the right set of uh, attributes are fed to the renderer, and you get your picture. Uh, but the cool thing is then that if I disable those two assignments, and I'll come over to that little preview of where our view, our scene is, And voila, everything is gray. Okay. So that is the overview of Cell. A bit long in the tooth, uh, but I felt it important to be thorough to kind of at least set your expectations that it's worth digging into uh, these things to learn more. So collections, expressions, drag and drop selections, uh, multiple places to pull your objects from if you need to, and the idea that everything uh, in terms of attributes and actions that you take because of them or the attributes that are a result of your actions can also be hierarchical and then also overridden. All right, let's take a look a bit at lighting and materials uh, as a quick overview that is a sort of precursor to the follow-up sessions. All right, so we got our evil little gargoyle here. Uh, what we want to talk about is the difference between a material node versus a network material, and then we'll talk a bit about the gap with 3D. All right, so uh, materials in Katana. The material node in its default setting will create a new material, as it says, uh, and then it presents you the option of adding those materials from whatever various rendering plugins you have loaded. If you've only got one, you will only be really presented the one. 
So you can assign uh, or create the shader of whatever type you want. You change the parameters. Straightforward. Fine. Uh, you assign it through a material assign node using cell, like we talked about here. We've just been drag and drop. Do the same with here. Now, what happens? So you say you want to connect an image map to a channel. Should you use the materials or something else? The answer is you don't use a material node to assign uh, an image map to a shader or a material, however you want to sort of call them. Um, why is that? So this node just makes the monolithic shader. If the shader had a parameter where you could give it a file name uh, as a custom shader or from a render vendor, then you could do that. Outside of those parameters, if you want to take uh, an image, load it, and assign it, you have to use this, which is up over here, which is the network material node. The difference is you hit tab, you save material, you're going to get the material node, no connections allowed. If you want to actually make a shading network, you just type in network material and that will bring in the node that is going to allow you to do that. Fundamentally, the uh, quick workflow, you establish the name for it, you decide which render are you using and which type of connection do you want to plug into this. Consider this is like the Maya shading group node. It manages the shading network on one side of it and it manages the connection to the geometry on the other side of it or it provides the entity in the scene graph or the scene graph location to be used. So you can see over here we have this network material because that's the name up over here. So when I take a look at this one here, Three to Light Marble, and we look at the scene, you don't see any of this network above it. Okay? You are only presented with one final node for scene graph location that comes from this node. So that's the one of the important things to, to understand. Um, the next part is that you then have the shading nodes from the plugins. So if I hit tab and I say star shading, uh, you will see that we have, in this case, this particular copy of Katana is set up to have Arnold, 3 to Light, and B-Ray. Each of these shading nodes then, when you bring it in, is giving you an option to set a name and then choose which of those options you want to use. Now, this is the sort of default uh, way to interact with shading nodes. There is a better way. Uh, we have something called the Tab Menu API. I'm just going to make this a little bit larger. And the Tab Menu API means that there's a formalized way of making tools that present a list of options. Uh, when, like this one, which is the tab. So what I have is a little uh, Python script so that when I hit S, it finds what is the current default renderer and will add uh, the ability to find the shading nodes. Right now, uh, outside of the nodes in here that say use 3 light, it's set up for Arnold, so it comes in with the Arnold standard shader. I use the same mechanism to have a little tool here to say that what am I going to set as the default? So right now, because I want to connect something to 3 light, I will say 3 light. It's fully customizable, Python, it's very handy. Uh, the other way of getting into things is these icon up here where you can create little Python scripts and then run them from the shelf. Uh, but I find myself constantly drawn towards the tab menu as a more uh, artist-friendly, interactive way simply because your hands and your mouse travel uh, a lot less uh, to do this and say that you want to have a three light material and then add it into your scene to connect it than you do if you uh, had to go all the way up to the shelf button. But the shelf button still um, has a lot of functionality. All right, so yes, fundamentally when you make a network material, you're connecting a shading node to it or a series of shading nodes. The shading nodes don't show in the scene graph they are just all bundled up behind uh, the network material. All right, so that we'll get into a lot more of this uh, next week, but I wanted to at least explain uh, 
why all this works the way it does and what the end, end result is. So fundamentally, you can create the same shady networks you could make anywhere. It comes down to what is the rendering plugin providing as the operators for that. And then again, the best way to interact with it is the little tab menu where you can say that you want uh, to find the tools and then they are appropriately named and uh, output the right name, the node itself is named the right thing, and it's all set to go. All right, so fundamentally, that's everything you need to know about uh, materials for now. Um, but again, just remember, you use different nodes to make the materials, different nodes to assign the materials, and now let's move on to talk about lighting. So any point in this node graph I can still come along and say that I want to uh, render from one of these. But what I know is that below or at this point, I don't have any lights, I don't have any shaders, it's just not going to work. Okay, that's fine. Uh, knowing that at this point I've got material assignments, we know it's going to work uh, a little bit better. Uh, we get to lighting, I would actually be able to see something. So I'm going to set up, uh, even though I'm going to do some lighting, I'm going to initiate my render from here. I'm going to then say I want to view from the same node, because remember what I was saying before, you can kind of get yourself a little disconnected if you're working with an image that you're creating from a node that is farther down in the node graph than the one that you're viewing. So here, the image I made is exactly the 3D, the version of the 3D scene that was fed to the rendering engine. Now I can actually come upstream and make some changes. So uh, what I have here is I've got the, all the nodes or the scene graph locations, I should say, uh, set with the live render update. I can come into uh, my gaffer three. So the gaffer three, there are two different gaffers. There's the old gaffer, which is there for legacy pipelines so that things don't blow up if you uh, have are working in an older pipeline to migrate. The Gaffer 3, new tool, that's where it's at. Please use that moving forward. Now, let's actually start from scratch. So I'm going to delete these lights and then add a new one. And you can see it pops in uh, instantly here. Uh, the particulars of each rendering plugin and how uh, interactive or what works for those plugins varies, but everybody is trying to work towards the same uh, common point, which is uh, a super interactive, polished experience. So when in doubt, uh, sort of check with the rendering plugin about what exact, act, exact live render updates they support at that point in time. Grid light happens to support pretty much everything, so that's why we're using it right here. All right, so a little dramatic top lighting, and then change intensities, change colors. Sinister per se. Uh, orange really isn't sinister, but all right. So the other thing to keep in mind is that the lights then have their own objects tab, materials tab, and light linking uh, tab. Cell works on the light linking. We'll get into a lot of that next week. Uh, materials shows you all the details of the light shader, and then objects is obviously translation, rotation, scale, or anything else that the vendor has decided is important. So in this case, I'm actually just going to uh, disconnect the expression that's keeping this into a square area light and really quickly just come in and say that I want to make this more of a strip light. And I gotta say, I absolutely love where rendering technology is these days. I started off much uh, earlier in the business uh, before ray tracing was really present and you had to essentially reconstruct light physics uh, through a series of cheats. And so the fact that everybody is now at this point where uh, 
it's all highly interactive, highly accurate, uh, and with PBR shading and the full ray tracing with lights and everything else, it's just cool. It's fun. You know, I, I'm in danger of sort of geeking out on lighting way too much, uh, too many types of the kind. All right, so simply put, you can do everything you need to in the gapper. Uh, there are other ways of creating lights for uh, rendering inside of Katana, but this is your kind of one-stop tool for doing so. And I recommend definitely starting here uh, when you want to get into things like uh, attaching HDR textures to lights and things like that. That's when it gets a, a bit different. Uh, but for now, if you were to explore lighting, no matter which rendering plugin you're using, uh, please start with the Gapper 3. You'll, you'll have a much better experience with it, and um, you know, you'll be up and making better, more engaging pictures faster, which will just help you get to terms with uh, all the ins and outs of Katana. Okay. So one little last fix there to get into. I just can't help myself. Right. Two lights, multiple bounces. You gotta love it, ray tracing. All right. So recapping what we're looking at though, we've got our 3D scene that is constructed of multiple objects or multiple nodes, some that reference external files, some that are just created internally, they get merged together. We have a shader network that gets represented as one scene graph location uh, that we can control and interact with in the live render or preview render. We also have the ability to create a single basic shader uh, that does not have uh, the ability to have things connected to it. So what you see is what you get in terms of controls. We have uh, the ability to assign different shaders to different objects, either by individual nodes, or we could use a stack node in this case. And finally, we've got the Gaffer 3, which is providing our lighting. And then we have the Katana Render Settings node and the Three Light Globals node there, uh, called the DL Settings, that are all combining to create the set of geometries and attributes that the renderer needs to make the cool picture. And that fundamentally is just the sort of nuts and bolts of materials and lights and how they kind of combine with the objects. All right, guys, before we call it, uh, I just want to do a bit of a recap for you. So remember Katana, the layout is modular. You can create whatever layouts you want save them to the layouts menu. Uh, there are certain tabs that are more important than others to your day-to-day -day workflow. The ones that are in this layout, uh, being the monitor, the viewer, the catalog, parameters, node graph, scene graph, and the attributes are kind of like your go-to. If you're just using Katana as an artist, you kind of, that's your sort of basic starting set. Then on top of that, we have the idea that everything in, is represented as nodes, but not every button click represents or is creates a node. So you're not going to scatter thousands and thousands of nodes. You're good that way. Uh, each node is either going to create or alter a scene graph uh, location. It's more likely if it's altering in some way, it's going to have a cell field. The cell field has the ability to run by expression run by path, and run by collections. Collections being like Maya selection sets, and the collections themselves can be defined by an expression. So if you come to terms with anything, learning about cell and reading up on it in the manual is a very good thing. Uh, there's a minimum viable set of nodes that you need to create an image. So you can work within Katana without necessarily having to have everything set up to render to disk to explore it is like 3D scene compositing in that you're taking various selections of elements and merging them together as you massage their uh, sort of state of being on the way through the node graph to finally result in a render. And that every node itself 
essentially is usually a 3D scene of some kind, or it represents a state of the 3D scene. And so just like when you click on a node inside of Nuke, you get represented uh, the image when you view it, you can use the same process in Katana to step back through your node graph to debug where things have gone a little bit uh, funky, if that is the case. You have your attributes, which are read-only, your parameters, which are the controls for the nodes, and the attributes themselves can be created on a hierarchical basis, so you can do things like assign lighting or a shader to the geometry level or the slash root world geometry or geo, and then you can go in and make assignments underneath it, just like we did with, with the scene. Uh, where we showed that you could have everything get a gray shader uh, and then go in and start cherry picking that you wanted all the teapots to be green and all the horses to get this sort of red shader. All right, so that kind of sums it up. It's been awesome spending this time with you. Uh, we'll do the Q&A and then please uh, join us on the forum. Continue on with questions. I will post these files up there so that those of you that uh, have uh, a trial downloaded of Katana can start to experiment with them and reference uh, the video. And this video itself will be posted as well. And then we'll also chunk it up into smaller uh, lesson sections by the time that we're done all three so that uh, the Katana learning uh, section of our website will be filled out. But thank you for your time. Uh, I realize that it's, you know, you all have lots of work to get done, to do in a day, and I appreciate you taking the time to either join us live or to watch this after uh, the session was broadcast.